Hey, Dave Kittle here. Welcome back to the Dave Kittle Show. Today we have Bill Snow on the podcast. He is a practitioner and advisor. He has gone through, I believe, uh, partnered with or, or helped acquire 50 different acquisitions or on the advisory side. We're going to get into his background. And Bill is also the author of Mergers and Acquisitions for Dummies, uh, the first edition and the second edition. If you are on Amazon, you should pick up the purple cover second edition. Uh, Bill's holding it up right now if you're watching on YouTube. So there's uh, there's the book. Bill, welcome on the show and tell the audience a little bit about yourself. Sure. David, thank you for having me. It's a real treat to get a chance to talk to you and, and your audience. So yeah, I'm an M&A investment banker. What's an investment banker? We do nothing with investments. We're not a bank, but we call ourselves investment bankers, of course. That's to confuse people, throw them off our trail. So uh, M&A, merger and acquisition. So that basically means buy companies, buying and selling companies. So we will help business owners buy or sell a company. Typically in the middle market, which we define as about 20 million to 300 million in revenue, that's US dollars, or we will help companies, usually larger companies, make acquisitions in that same space, that roughly 20 to $300 million in revenue. Excellent. And are you still engaged on the investment banking side or are you more focused now on any other projects or authoring, you know, future editions of the book or where are you at in terms of your day to day? I am very much an investment banker and what I'm doing with, with the book. And it, and it was a great honor to be contacted by a big publisher like Wiley. They contacted me back in 10, actually back in 08. It took a while to, to put the, the book together, but in 08, we signed a contract, came out with the first book in 11. And then last year they contacted me to, uh, to do it again. I love it. I love the chance to be able to, to write. And it's very cathartic for me being able to work through a lot of the logic and explanation. I'm very much a writing preference learner. And so I might be very good at something from having done it. But when I can sit down and work through the logic and put pen to paper or fingers to keyboard these days, it is very, very helpful for me. So I, I like doing the writing and the speaking before the pandemic. I was going overseas and that was starting to ramp up. Unfortunately, that has been curtailed. Hopefully that starts coming back. But I enjoy doing that. I was speaking around the U.S. quite a bit. I'd like to do a lot more of that. So more of the, the front end marketing, if you will, for the investment banking practice, and then being able to create opportunities and then work with uh, very skilled and experienced team members to be able to turn things over uh, to them to to help execute the the transaction. So I come, on, come at it from uh, spending years doing the execution. So making the phone calls, getting the materials out, setting up the meetings, negotiating, getting the offers, uh, closing the deal, and so forth. So I come at it from, from that perspective. And now I'm focused and happened for a while on the, the front end marketing. Excellent. And so you have been with your experience mostly on the sell side or a little bit of sell side and buy side? A little both. Most more more on the sell side, but I've I've done a fair bit of buy side. I've got in fact I've got a buy side client now. Uh we just closed a deal uh, a couple of weeks ago and we're in talks. I can't say much, but we're in talks with another one. So hopefully we'll have another another buy side deal. We've got a couple sell side clients that we're working with as well. Excellent. And so for the healthcare practitioners, the physical therapy practice owners, business owners that watch or listen to this show, I know this is going to be helpful. This is the guy that actually wrote the book <laughs> on mergers and acquisitions. And so if you're watching or listening the next few minutes or the next amount of time that we're going to speak here, we're going to be focusing on you, the audience of who you're thinking about selling some or all of your practice, selling you know the next chapter, getting into the next chapter of your life. We're going to talk about um, even maybe some deal terms. We're going to talk about the process. So, Bill, just to kind of kick it off, because, again, I appreciate your time, your your expertise on curtailing this talk uh, towards these potential sellers, the sellers sure. that might be, sure. you know, 40, 50, maybe 60, 70, 80 years old in that range somewhere. And they're for multiple different reasons, whether there's emotions, whether there's logic, they're maybe thinking about the next chapter of their life, maybe de-risking some things. Maybe they want to invest in real estate and they need some money for that. Um, there's a whole host of different reasons. What would be an initial starting point of this discussion that we can help some of these practice owners, give them some clarity uh, about the process or maybe just demystify some of the steps? Sure, sure. For anybody who has a business thinking about selling a business, so whether that's a medical practice, as you've been talking about and working with Dave or just any other kind of business, for me, for the sellers, for me, they should always focus on put together the plan that makes sense for them. 
So what are you looking to accomplish? Because you'll get a lot of overtures if you're a business owner. You're going to get a lot of overtures from uh, uh, Dave. He, he tells me he sends out, what, about five or six letters a day. No, I'm, I'm kidding you. But you've, you've, done, you've done some letters and some good over, uh, some good outreach. Uh, but business owners get a lot of outreach, phone calls and emails and letters. And the most important thing, if you are a business owner, what are you looking to accomplish? Do you want to retire and get out completely? Are you looking to take some chips off the table and put a little money in your pocket and then maybe sell the remaining part of the business in a few years? Are you looking for a partner who handles some of the things that you don't like or you're not good at? And so to that extent, instead of just reacting to an offer that's coming over the transom and trying to rig it and fit it into your plans, I think it's much better if you figure out your plan and then go seek out that potential partner who helps you accomplish what you're looking to accomplish. Yeah, absolutely. So in the pre-interview, um, you were, you know, we were kind of hashing out this and you, the seller that's watching or listening, you certainly should kind of start with like, what do you want to do? Which is what, Bill, what you just said. And then kind of like, what's your plan? What's your, where do you want to go? Are you looking to maybe keep 60 uh, are you looking to sell 60 or 70% of your practice and then retain a, a pretty sizable and, and meaningful percentage of the practice? Or are you looking to get out, sell hundred percent, this, you know, the buyer like us, we're, we're going to want you to probably stay for at least six months, maybe a year. And sometimes maybe longer, two or three years. It depends on, on the business and the practice. And, um, I like what you said in the pre-interview and what you kind of hinted at right now, which is like, trying to find a partner, a potential partner or buyer that matches that plan. And I think that is a, a good yeah. point because most of the time it's just reactionary of like, okay, well, this corporate or this buyer, they're reaching out to me, they're sending me emails or letters, or we spoke with them at some industry conference or event and it's kind of reactionary, but you're kind of right. saying like, before you start it, it's like be proactive in like, your situation and kind of see what of the buyers like us were, you know, on the smaller side, we're just getting started versus corporates that have dozens of locations, which of us, which of all these buyers might fit your plans and your situation the best. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. What are you looking to uh, accomplish? And if you have a, a good idea of what you're looking to accomplish, then you can communicate that to the other side. Now, why is that important? It's not just important for yourself. And of course, that's that's a big part of it. Somebody has to write an offer. Now, I buy companies, too, for clients. And when somebody says, yeah, we'll do whatever. How can I write that offer? What is that? You know, I don't know what whatever is. And I, and I get it. The, the person's trying to be helpful. and They're open minded. And there's nothing wrong with that. But it's a little difficult to write that offer, whatever. Now, if somebody says, I want to sell everything. I want to retire. I'm happy to stick around for a you know transition period for you know three months, six months, a year, whatever. Okay, yeah, I can put that together. I'd like to sell a majority piece, hold on to a small piece, and sell that in a few years. Maybe have the buyer buy it back, or maybe if the the buyer sells to somebody else. Okay, I can write that. I can put that together. But I can't write an offer as a buyer until I have some input in terms of some specificity in terms of what a seller is looking to accomplish. Yeah, makes a lot of sense. So in this process of, as we're kind of on this call, this this episode, kind of coaching some of these practice owners, what would be like the next logical step or, or some of the next, like the next series of things, whether it's, I mean, we've talked in this, on the show a lot about, you know, brokers and advisors and that whole process, but like, what are, are there other things internally that they need to figure out that they need to align before they kind of enter this process? Sure, sure. A great, great question. Make yourself expendable. That's if you're looking to sell your business and especially retire and get out. If you're not needed to run the business day to day, that business is going to be worth a lot more. So just think about uh, a sole practitioner because Dave, we were talking about this in our, our, our pre-show chat. You know, that, that sole practitioner might be doing a great job and has great uh, uh, clients and is doing really good work and everybody's happy. But what is that practice worth? That person retires and moves on. That person is the practice. And so what has the buyer bought? you know, those, do those customers stick around? Maybe they do, maybe they don't. So that becomes a challenge in, in those situations for a business where the owner is integral or has at least appears to be integral to the ongoing success of the business. So the first thing is if you want to 
sell the business. Think about what would you be willing to buy if somebody came to you and said, buy my business. And by the way, I'm going to retire and I'm the only person here. And once I go, who knows what the customers are going to do? How much would you be willing to pay for that? So think about it from put put a buyer's eye on. Would somebody offer the, or somebody take the same offer that you're making? And if the answer is probably no, you're probably making a bad offer. But if you can make the business run where it, you're not needed, it's worth more. And then think about what you like and what you don't like about the business. And maybe maybe you're looking for a situation where you can keep working, but a buyer is able to do a lot of the things. Maybe it's the back office, the scheduling, finding customers, marketing, all that kind of stuff. Maybe you don't like that. Maybe you just want to focus on uh, uh, providing the, the physical therapy. Maybe that's what you really enjoy and all that other stuff. You'd rather have someone else do. Well, maybe that makes sense to, to find out, uh, uh, to find a partner, whether it's respond to an overture uh, like from somebody from from David or, or from from other firms that might be looking to to do a roll up of uh, of medical practices. Yeah, absolutely. And and an example, we had a previous guest named Mike Studer. He had sold his three locations to a corporate a couple of years ago, and he was treating patients uh, fifty something hours a week. And he had a, an agreement uh, within the deal that he was going to stay for two years after the data closed, and then he over time wound down or decreased the amount of patient care hours that he, and, and this is all public, he mentioned it himself on the show. And so that was that was one example of someone who was in the trenches that he loves treating patients, he loves the clinical side, he loves teaching the clinical side, which is fine, that's great. But that was because he was not a complete absentee owner that there that needed to be kind of figured out in the deal because sure. if, if someone went from 50, 60 hours of treatment patient care along with other roles and responsibilities of keeping the practice operating successfully, um, if that person just pulls back to 20 hours of patient care or no hours of patient care per week, I mean, that would leave a massive hole in regards to the amount of patients treated and yeah. revenue and all that. And so that was one example where that was you know, decided upfront as part of the deal, and but it allowed him over time for two years to wean slowly out of the practice completely from all the roles and responsibilities yeah. of patient care and operating and everything. Yeah. And, and and that sounds like that was a great way of structuring a deal and, and putting that together. And that, that's a great insight too for other uh, doctors, practitioners who might be watching this. If you're in that same sort of situation, if you are thinking about doing a transaction, selling the business, all the business, and you are the centerpiece of the business, then when you make the approach or you respond, yeah, talk about it that way. Look, I know I'm the centerpiece. Here's my thought. Uh, I'm open to a multi-year situation where I slowly back out of this and you know we could figure out those uh, the specifics. That's going to go a lot farther in a conversation than uh, I'm, I'm, I have great practice here. I'm the only person and I want to sell. I want to get top dollar. and I don't want to come back to work tomorrow. Ah, you know, that that's going to be a, that's going to be a tough sell. So uh, what you just sketched out there, I think, makes makes a lot of sense. And, and again, that's looking at the individual practice, the individual person who's running that practice or owning that practice and figuring out what they want to do in a way to structure the best deal possible to help them achieve their goals. Got it. Uh, let's talk a little bit about uh, uh, personal guarantees on or uh, excuse me, seller finance, seller note. Uh, with or without a personal guarantee, if you were representing a seller who is watching or listening, um, in a pre-interview, we talked about you know cash is king, and uh, obviously anyone that's selling their practice, whatever you agree with a potential buyer on in regards to the price and the valuation, um, whatever like you want, ideally you're looking for all of it. You're looking for 100% cash at close if possible, or the most uh, possible. And it doesn't always work out that way. And what are what are some things that we can talk about there in regards to sure. uh, cash close and seller's note, seller finance, and sure, sure. how uh, sellers can kind of you know understand that process? Sure, sure. Um, yeah, that's that's a great point. When you're putting together these these deals, so cash at close. I mean, who who would not prefer that? Of course, you'd want to get all the dough at close or substantially all the money at close. But what I always ask is a hypothetical. We talked about this on our uh, pre-discussion. Uh, and by the way, everybody watching this, uh, Dave started this, and we spent 20 minutes me interviewing him. I kind of flipped it around on him a little bit here. I should and I should have <laughs> recorded that. I wish we got that. Um, but the hypothetical I use is, okay, let's say someone's going to pay you $10 for something, and they'll, I'll give you $10 right now. Okay, maybe that's a pretty good deal. And someone else says, I'll give you $5 today and $10 in a year. 
So that's $15 total, but you have to wait a year to get part of those proceeds. What is the better deal? And the answer is you can't answer that situation based on those two inputs. $10 today, yeah, that sounds pretty good. But maybe in certain situations, a deal that pays $15 takes you a year to get all that money. Maybe that is the better transaction. So you you can't decide yay or nay just because there's some structuring that that's automatically a bad thing, not necessarily at all. Now, along with the structuring, if a, if a buyer asks you to take a note instead of some of the proceeds, okay, maybe that makes sense. Are you getting paid some interest on it? You've got to put that money somewhere, maybe keeping at least some of the money for some period of time in the business you know, presumably getting a good interest rate on it. You got to have that money work for you. Maybe keeping it in your business makes sense. I would make sure that that note is secure. In other words, it's not an unsecured note because if it's not secured, what's your recourse in case the new owner defaults on that loan, stops making the interest payments, refuses to pay back the principal and so forth. So you'd want to have some sort of security, some sort of guarantee. Talk to your lawyer about that. I'd always work with an experienced M&A attorney where you have security, where you would have recourse, and maybe that's going after the personal assets of the buyer. Sorry, Dave, I'm putting you on the spot there, but no, it's I, fine. I, I, I would I would make sure, and I would make sure you have an experienced M&A attorney uh, who's handle these sort of uh, structuring situations and, and lean on that attorney to help you uh, navigate, but, but make sure you do have recourse with uh, uh, securitized against the, the personal assets, or at least if the business is big enough, may, maybe the business assets will be sufficient. Right, and so let, I'll give a quick example. So let's say, uh, Bill, if you were representing your uh, investment banking side, you were representing a potential seller of a physical therapy business, you and the seller, let's say you believe the practice is worth, or you guys want 1.7 million, and I'll, I'll give a bigger gap in number. So let's say we say, we think it's worth a million and you guys think it's worth 1.7. So there's a $700,000 gap in the middle. Usually it's probably a lot closer in terms of like percentage, but just for the example, and we could potentially find some agreement of some seller note. And maybe we say, well, we'll give you a million dollars at the close. And maybe we'll offer, I don't know, we could say 500 grand, 600 grand, 700 grand as some seller's finance or seller's note which like you said, will be paid out over time. So maybe we, if we agreed on this hypothetical deal, you're the seller who you're representing, we say a million dollars will pay at the closing date and there'll be some seller's note for let's say $600,000, which will have some interest rate to it. And we agree to you know monthly payments or quarterly payments, whatever it might be right. uh, over time with that interest rate attached to it. And there's some pros and cons to it. Like you said, we want to pay the least amount of cash or close. And so maybe we, maybe you guys say yes to that deal. And so we get a potential $1.7 million physical therapy business for a million dollars of cash expenditure right now, potentially. Sure. And then obviously there's the seller note in the middle. Sure. And typically the seller financing, the seller note, it could be unsecured or not collateralized. But in your, you're saying, that you would advise sellers to have me or my team, me and my team, uh, sign a personal guarantee on that note so that if we come in and wreck the business or whatever, which obviously we're trying to grow it, we're sure, not, we're, we don't want that to happen. But if we come in and do some crazy stuff, or like you said, just say, uh, no, we're not going to owe you that money. Uh, I'm not going to pay you. Screw you. We're not going to pay you and or come to us or whatever. Yeah, right, right. And so that $600,000 seller's note you're saying you would advise your clients to have us sign a personal guarantee so that the payments are guaranteed. It's just that they're, they're going to be in a cadence or a frequency pushed out into the future. And we can maybe find a deal there because we're bridging that gap. We're using that $600,000 seller's note to bridge the gap between what we think it's worth, let's just say a million, and what you and your team think it's worth, which is 1.7 million. So maybe you say yes to that, or maybe the seller says yes to that. And again, this is not, um, you'll have to talk to your lawyer and your accountant because this is a little bit of, there's, you know, there's tax implications and you're going to get taxed less if you're taking a million dollars in on that day. You're going to pay more in taxes if you're taking 1.6 or $1.7 million if that were the hypothetical deal, right? So there's some tax implications as well. And there's pros and cons, like you said, of like, if you get paid more for, you know, that, that $10 item today or the $5 item today and 
I'll, sure. I'll give you the rest of the money in a year. And so there's tax implications. There's a lot of uh, deal dynamics. And I mean, also like, where is the seller? Do they need that money for, I don't know, real estate or their parents, uh, nursing home or I mean, there, there's always reasons like, do they need that money? Or are they going to just like put it in Vanguard? They're going to put it into some other investment vehicle. So there's like a whole host of reasons as to like why this deal structure might be appropriate for them or not. Yeah, right. And you you can't come up with a one size fits all approach because it really depends on each individual. What are they looking to accomplish in the sale? What are they looking to accomplish in their career? What do they want for their clients? What do they want for their employees? What do they want with uh, for the, for their vendors or any other business partners they have? There's no right or wrong answer to all of this. An asset is worth what two sides agree it's worth. So one side might think it's worth 1.7. Somebody else might think it's worth one. Well, what's it worth? Is it worth 1.7? I don't know. Is it worth a million? I don't know. It's worth whatever those two agree to. Now, if somebody is expecting 1.7 and someone bids a million and that's all, take it or leave it, and you have just one bidder, one suitor who's put up an offer, then that's the market. It's a million dollars. And you can go out and try and find other suitors and maybe other bidders would be willing to pay more. But even if you got multiple offers, let's say, say you're selling a business, what we tell our, our clients, and it's a very powerful thing. We'll go out and reach out to 100, 200 potential buyers We'll probably send out from that 30, 40, 50, 60 books, right? We will get probably five to 10 indications of interest that have an initial valuation. We'll set up some meetings with some of those five, six, seven, something like that, depending on how it goes. We'll get multiple offers, two, three, four, five letter of intents that have a specific valuation. Now, after you have cleared that market, talked with all those potential suitors, that tells you something. And what you'll see is a trading band quite often. And a pretty, those, let's just say there's four offers. Those four offers quite often are, are pretty closely banded together. And, and let's just say they're at a million bucks, roughly a million bucks, give or take. The seller was expecting one seven. What would that tell us? We have talked to the market. The people that didn't bid, that's a bit of intel because they're not interested for whatever reason. Those that did are all coming in at a pretty similar uh, number. You think it's worth a million seven? You know, we'll see what we can do to to move some of these, see if we get some competition. Uh, but an asset is only going to be worth what two people agree it's worth. Right. And I heard you on another interview that sometimes a seller, you guys might get an outlier bid sometimes. Sure. Yeah, right. And a good point. And yeah, so you do that, you do that process. Maybe you get three or four offers and you see that trading ban and then you get that outlier. Okay, well, look, we've got a bunch that were right around a million, give or take a hundred thousand. And holy cow, someone's put together uh, you know, one point eight million and it's mostly cash at close and a small note. Well, we'd have to look at well, what's going on? Is this a viable buyer? Are they uh, able to close? Is it just someone looking to, to paper uh, the universe? Sometimes that goes on as well. But no, they've done a lot of acquisitions. Uh, they've got a good reputation. We've made some phone calls. We've we've checked out some of the the groups that they've bought, and it looks like they've got the money. You know, then, then you start feeling pretty good. And why are they looking to make that acquisition? Why did they bid higher than everybody else? They don't know what other people bid. But they figured we're going to come up with a number because we really want to make this acquisition. Maybe this this company has some sort of strategic imperative for us beyond the revenue, beyond the profit it's generating. It does something else, fits a hole in our service offerings. And boy, that has just been a real pain point because we don't have this service offering. And we know it has cost us not just in the sales in that particular product, but other products or services that might be tangentially related. You know, So that might be a reason why a buyer is willing to pay what seems to be a big price. You have to find that strategic imperative. I, I like that, how you kind of broke it down. Like you, you want to dig into why, like it could be they're looking and sometimes they'll say it, right? Like they're looking to uh, step into a new geographical region, right? Sure. Like they'll, sure. they'll sometimes say it. Uh, now, if they don't say it, is that sometimes concerning or you want to get a reason from them or have you experienced uh, some of these outlier bids where they do it to potentially uh, get everyone's attention, get under exclusivity. They start going into due diligence and they start, you know, making excuses and trying to knock the price back down to the one oh, million or the oh, one point one. 
Oh, re- retrading a deal? Oh, oh my God, no, no. I listen. I'm such a good investment banker that we, we get a deal done. That, they, never, that yeah. never happens, right? No, oh, never. I mean, that, that's just the amateurs that, that kind of stuff happens. No, no, that that happens uh, on a regular basis, and and that's that's we call that a retrade. And absent some sort of material change in the business, material change meaning you know uh, the revenues have dropped, the profits have dropped, the big customer fires them, you know something like that, where someone says, okay, we'll we'll bid. Uh, you know, twenty million. I'm just talking about some of the you know transactions I've worked on. Twenty million. Okay, well, that, hey, that that's pretty good. Everybody else is around twelve or thirteen. Let's go with the twenty million, and it's all cash at close. And they start finding ways of winnowing down the price. That's a retrade. And why are they doing that? Well, they're obviously trying to knock everybody else out. And and this is why when you're a business owner and you're looking to hire somebody to represent you in a sale, the most important aspect of the work that somebody like me, what we do, what investment bankers do, is the ability to negotiate. Because you don't want somebody who is going to fold and cave in with the slightest little bit of push, someone who's so desperate to do a deal, any deal, that they will give up. And the way that that starts is when you negotiate your contract with somebody like me, get the fee proposal from the investment banker or the broker and cut their fees to the bone. OK, and then say, I'm prepared to work on this basis. If that investment banker says hot dog, you got, you know, I'll take it. Yeah, I'll take it. Do not hire that person. The way they negotiate with you is how they will negotiate for you. And it is penny wise, pound foolish. If you are willing to take somebody who just folded like a house of cards, just with a little bit of pressure. Guess what? When the going gets tough, they're going to fold like a house of cards. Uh, when you're doing these transactions, we had a, a deal where that happened and they kept trying to uh, retrade us. And uh, we we had an inventory issue. This was a, a product manufacturer of uh, drink dispensing stuff. And, and we had disclosed we had $2 million worth of slow moving equipment in a foreign country. And we, this was an issue. Uh, so they tried to use that at the last minute to lower the price. And so we had a meeting in a in a city outside of Detroit, uh, because that's where the uh, one of the executives was. The company's not located in Detroit, and the the seller was was so uh, I don't want to say desperate, but they definitely wanted to do a deal. They gave us a sheet, and they said they had eight or ten issues that we had to settle through relatively minor stuff, and then they had purchase price adjustment because of the inventory. They left that fill in the blank, and so I I huddled with my <laughs> my my client, and I said. We got them. And I was I just wanted to say, you guys have a flight to catch in two hours. I was going to kick them out. And and the the client wanted to do something. So I said, okay, if we if you agree to these eight or ten points, it was all in our favor. If you agree to these things, we'll agree to a half million dollar price concession. And that was the final transaction. But you have to have somebody that can negotiate, isn't afraid of uh, uh, asking for something, isn't afraid for for holding firm. You have to be professional. There was no yelling and screaming, anything like that. But that is one of the most important aspects of hiring somebody like me, that ability to negotiate. I, I love that. I want to recap that really quick. So the physical therapy practice owners watching or listening, if they are interviewing, uh, potentially retaining a broker advisor, and sometimes I have had other investment bankers on the show. So it could be broker advisor, inv- investment banker, similar. I mean, you guys are a little bit on the higher end, but similar in terms sure. of the role. Yeah. And If you that are watching or listening, the practice owner, if you have an individual like that or a firm like that, and they cave on their fees or their commission or whatever it might be, where then you on the short term, the practice owner maybe benefits because you're like, oh, I I can maybe get these this firm or this this agency, uh, this advisory firm for a lower fee. That's how those individuals will, will negotiate for you with potential buyers like us or other buyers. So in the short term, you might think you got a win there, but then you will lose yeah. because they're going to fold also yeah. when yeah. there's buyers like us trying to negotiate the actual yeah. purchase price and yeah. or the terms. I yeah. love that. Love yeah. that distinction. Yeah. Yeah. The the uh, I didn't want to concede that half million. But again, the client wanted to do it. We could wrap this thing up. So I, I, I made sure. But this is the other thing, too, is you don't agree. OK, here's a half million dollar uh, concession. Now let's hash it out with these other eight or ten points. We've lost all leverage. So I could get everything in our favor. On Again, they were relatively minor points. The big thing was, was this purchase price adjustment. But I could get all of that in our favor, largely in our favor, for 
I figured we have to pay half a million dollars. The other thing that that worked out well is when, when you negotiate as much as possible, you know, you want to win the battle. You want to be fair. Look, a deal's only going to get done if it makes sense for both sides. But if you can let the other side have that last little victory, win the last skirmish, so they can go back to their bosses, the conquering hero. Look what we got. Uh, that helps as well. So they were able to, this was a big PE firm that we were negotiating with. They were able to go back to uh, their bosses and say, look, we got half a million dollars out of them. Look, look what we extracted from the the, the trip we made to Detroit. Uh, you know, that, that becomes, that wasn't necessarily by design, but that has happened more often than not. And then as a coda for that, a uh, few years later, after, after the first edition of the book came out, one of the PE guys was in town and he wanted to get together. And I said, okay, fine. Hey, the dust settled. I mean, it was kind of a contentious thing, but you know, the dust settles, everything's fine. And he sends me an email and he says, I'm bringing a copy of the book. I want you to sign it and write something funny. And I thought, oh, great. You know, cause I think I'm pretty funny, but I just, the, the, I always marvel at the authors who can talk to someone for 10 seconds and come up with a clever thing. I don't have that. I wish I did. So I thought about it. So he gave me his copies of the book and I, I wrote in there, Justin, thanks for the house, Bill. <laughs> yeah. it, it was it was a pretty nice fee <laughs> which uh, awesome. there, there you go, go. beautiful there you house see, if you're, you can, if you can see that you can see the fee yeah you can see the fee there you go well All i actually bought that i bought i bought the house beforehand but but he thought that was funny the uh the, the comment yeah that was great well i bill i would love to have you back in the future i'm going to sure. screen share really quick um i'm going to pull up the book on amazon so that folks sure. can see uh, where they can go get it. What are some other places for the book? Is, do you have it on your personal website or is it just Amazon only? Well, any place that they sell fine books, which of course today means amazon.com, uh, but you can get it on Barnes and Noble. You can get it on uh, Books a Million, any place they sell books. But I, I know from looking at the royalty statements, uh, Amazon is is pretty much the, the way to go these days. You can buy the ebook, you can buy the paper book. Uh, I was contacted after the first book came out and someone else did the the audio. We don't have an audio of this. Hopefully, they'll contact me, and maybe I'll have the time this this time because I would love to try to do the audio. But uh, so we don't have the audio, but it, hopefully, at some point, we'll have that as well. Yeah, and, and I was going to say you have a voice for audio because some people with audio books they'll have like an actor or you know a voiceover person uh, do the audio book on Audible, and and Amazon own, owns Audible as well. So right, you would right. you would do the voice for the audio book. I, I hope so. I was contacted initially and they said, well, let's just put you in there and see if you can read, which is always uh, when you're a writer, being able to read. <laughs> yeah. You know, the, the reason we write is because we can't read. And do you have a voice that that resonates enough? And I, I don't know if I do or not, but I, I would sure like to try if I'm not the guy to read it. I'm not offended, but I, I would prefer to be able to read it just because I think it would be fun to experience that. And uh, of course, I have such lovely tones as your your. Uh, uh, listeners can can laugh. I'm sure they're just it just the, the the thoughts are just racing in their mind. Just listen to me. I, I'm sure I'm spurring all kinds of genius thoughts out of them just with this lovely voice that I have. So I, I would like to be able to do that on a much bigger scale as well. I love it, Bill. Appreciate your time, folks. Go check out Mergers and Acquisitions for Dummies, the second edition, the purple cover. If you're if you're listening to this on iTunes or Spotify, it's the purple cover, the second edition. Uh, on Amazon. We'll link to it in the show notes. And uh, Bill, when you hopefully, if and when you do the audio book, come back on here. Let's promote it. Let's get you back on here for another conversation. Would love to. Absolutely. Thank you. Excellent, Bill. Thank you. And to the audience, if you find this helpful and valuable, go ahead and subscribe to the show, Dave Kittle Show on YouTube, or find it on iTunes or Spotify. We'll catch you next time here on the show. Bye now. Hey, it's Dave Kittle. Are you a healthcare business owner or physical therapy practice owner who is looking to figure out your succession plan or exit strategy? We might be able to help. And in fact, we may be interested in acquiring your practice. If you're interested, you can reach out to me. Shoot me an email at dave at conciergepainrelief.com. That's D-A-V-E at C-O-N-C-I-E-R-G-E, painrelief.com or you can call me at any time, 646-781-8884.